Hey guys, Mike with Financeable here. Today we're gonna to tackle one of the most common interview questions in finance, which is, walk me through a DCF. This question often trips people up because they get lost in the weeds of the question, and we're gonna give you a simple framework to nail the question and get the job. By the way, if you like these interview question reviews and you find them helpful, definitely hit subscribe down below. We have a lot more coming. Let's hop in here. So when people try to answer this question, one of the biggest pitfalls is getting lost in the weeds. And what you need is a big picture framework, and we have a five-step framework here for answering this question so that that doesn't happen to you. We're gonna go through the five steps at a very high level. We're then gonna walk through all the bits and pieces in detail one by one, and then we'll come back and recap exactly how you'd answer this in an interview. Let's walk through the five steps briefly here, and then we'll dive into the details. So you begin with calculating your stage one cash flows. You then calculate terminal value, which is your stage two value. You then discount back stage one and stage two at your weighted average cost of capital, which gives you enterprise value. And then you can work from enterprise value to equity value by subtracting debt and adding cash. And if you're asked to calculate to a price per share, you would then take that equity value and divide by the number of shares at that point. So those are the five steps. And what we're gonna do is now walk through each of those steps in a little bit more detail. And again, when you answer the question, you wanna stay high level, but we want you to have some of the nuts and bolts in case you are dragged down into the details. So let's take a look. So before we go through the five steps, just a quick note, we're doing a standard DCF where we start with unlevered free cash flow, which is cash flow not affected by debt, work to enterprise value, and then ultimately to equity value. And that type of approach, uh, the unlevered approach, is what is most common in interviews. There is another approach using levered free cash flow. It's not nearly as common. Uh, we'll make a video on that uh, down the road. Uh, but for now, we're gonna stick with the most common question. In step one, what we're gonna calculate is our stage one cash flows. And what we mean by cash flow is the money generated by the business after paying taxes and accounting for reinvestments. And in particular, we're calculating unlevered free cash flow, so we're not gonna incorporate the impact of any type of debt. To walk through this step by step, we're gonna start with EBIT, which is the profit of the business. We then take out taxes because we have to pay our taxes. We add back non-cash charges, which is really just depreciation and amortization in most cases, because those are not cash expenditures, but we needed to include them in EBIT to calculate our taxes appropriately. We then deduct capital expenditures or reinvestment in the business. And then we adjust for changes in networking capital, which is a longer conversation that we're gonna cover in a future video. But the short story is, it's another form of reinvestment in things like inventory. Let's imagine you're starting a pizza shop and you need to set it up. You're gonna to need to buy inventory for that pizza shop, which ties up cash. And that's what we're talking about with uh, changes in networking capital. So in short, when we calculate all those things out, we work to unlevered free cash flow, which again is the excess cash flow generated by the business after taking into account taxes and reinvestments. Now, before we move on, I wanna make a quick note about stage one versus stage two. So down below, I've drawn out a little diagram, which shows revenue and time. So most businesses, and you guys may have seen this in another video, most businesses start small, they inflect in their growth, at some point they mature and level out. And we can use that to explain what stage one means. So when we calculate stage one, what we're doing is we're calculating to the point of maturity for the business. Now, the standard answer for the question of how long you project out for stage one versus stage two is five to 10 years, which is fine. But really what you're doing is projecting until the business hits maturity or some sort of steady state. And then you project your stage two with simplifying assumptions beyond that point. So just wanna make sure that point is clear. As an aside, we have another video on stage one versus stage two, if you wanna check that out. So now in step two, we're gonna calculate our terminal value. Terminal value reflects the value beyond stage one. And there are two ways to calculate terminal value. The first way is the perpetuity growth method over on the left here. And what we do there is we take all the cash flows out beyond our stage one and then bring them back to today at a constant growth rate. And that creates our terminal value. The way we do that mechanically is we take our cash flow at the final period of stage one, which is typically the fifth year, which is why we're using five here. And what we do is we then um, multiply that cash flow by one plus our terminal growth rate or our perpetual growth rate, which is typically around GDP because businesses can't outgrow GDP perpetually. 
And then we divide by our discount rate, which is our WAC, which we'll get to in a second, minus our growth rate. And what that does is it takes our cash flows as of year five, carries them out into infinity, and then brings them back to today, um, and that gives us our terminal value. Now, if you think about that in substance, what we've done is we've taken all our cash flows out into the future and brought them back to the end of stage one. And really what that represents is the value of the business beyond stage one. That leads me to the second method, which is the exit multiple method and the short, really a shortcut method, but honestly the most common in practice in my experience. Um, so with the exit multiple method, what we do is we say, okay, well, if that's the value of the business beyond Stage one, we can just use a multiple based approach to value the business at the end of our stage one, and that will suffice instead of using the perpetuity growth formula. The most common way of doing that is taking EBITDA and then multiplying it by our EV to EBITDA multiple based on peer valuations, and that gets us to terminal value. Now, there's an important thing I want you to understand here though, which is both of these methods get you to the same place. So it's not as if one is an alternative to the other. If you use the perpetuity growth method, you're making an implicit assumption about the exit multiple method and vice versa. It's really two different ways of doing the same thing. Whichever method you choose, you end up with terminal value, which is again, the value beyond stage one. Now that we have our stage one and stage two values calculated out, the next step is to discount those values back to today using our weighted average cost of capital or WAC. So before we move ahead, I wanna make a quick note on WAC uh, because this often throws people for a loop. So the short story here is WAC is just a discount rate and any discount rate really just reflects the cost or riskiness of a particular set of cash flows. The thing is most businesses have multiple capital providers. So they'll have lenders and investors at the very least, sometimes more. And those capital providers have different risk profiles and thus different expected rates of return. So for example, if I have a lender that gets paid before my investors, they are taking less risk and thus have a lower cost of capital than my investor who gets paid second and is going to have a higher cost of capital or expected return. The problem here is that we can't discount back by the lender's cost of capital because they're taking less risk and thus have a lower expected return or discount rate. And we also can't discount back at the investor's cost of capital because they're taking more risk and have a higher discount rate. So what we do is we blend their expected returns to get to a weighted average cost of capital. And that's where this whole concept comes from. So now let's move down to the formula. Make this a little bit more complicated here for a second. So the way that this works, is we take our lender's expected rate of return, the cost of debt or K sub D, and we multiply by one minus the tax rate because interest from a company's perspective is tax deductible. So the true cost to the company is the after tax cost. And then we just multiply by the proportion of debt relative to the total of debt plus equity. And what we're saying here is what's the proportional cost of the debt in the capital structure? We then take our investor's expected return or the cost of equity, and then multiply that by their proportional contribution to the total capital of the business, the equity over debt plus equity. And that gets us a blended expected return or cost of capital for the business. Now I jumped over cost of equity fairly quickly. We actually have a whole separate video that walks through the concept of cost of equity in quite a bit of detail if you wanna check it out. Now we can wrap up this step. And to do that, what we're gonna do is take all the cash flows we projected out for stage one, as well as our terminal value. And we're gonna discount them back at one plus our discount rate, which is whack in this case, raised to the number of periods. And when we do that, what we're really doing is pulling the cash flows all the way across the board, along with the terminal value, back to time zero. Get rid of all these. And when we pull those cash flows back, what we're really showing is the price we would pay for the right to all the future cash flows of the business, which is just the purchase price of the entire business, which we call enterprise value. Enterprise value is just a fancy term for purchase price of the entire business. So now we have the enterprise value and we can move on to the next step. Now in step four, we're gonna work from enterprise value to equity value. And as I said in the last step, enterprise value is the price to buy the entire business. 
Equity value, on the other hand, is what the owner owns, the value to the owner. So to get to equity value, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with enterprise value, so the value of the business, then think of this as we're selling the business. We're then gonna subtract out debt because if we sold the business, we'd have to pay the lenders first. We're gonna add cash because let's imagine you owned a business and you sold it. If there were excess cash in the company's bank account, that would be your money. And that gets you to equity value, which again is just really what the owner owns of the business, so their ownership stake in the business at a given point in time. Now in step five, we have our final and potentially optional step. So in a lot of cases, you aren't asked to calculate the price per share, but if you are, uh, this is what you would do, and it's a fairly simple exercise. So to calculate the price per share, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the equity value that you just calculated and divide by the fully diluted share count of the business to get to price per share. Now you'll notice in the drawing that I just said number of shares uh, as opposed to the fully diluted share count, and that was actually intentional. When you're explaining this in an interview, I would just say we take equity value and we divide by the number of shares to get to price per share. If you say fully diluted share count, they'll drag you into that calculation discussion and it becomes much more complicated. So I'd start with that, and if they drag you into the weeds of that, then you can discuss fully diluted shares, which is really just your basic shares plus any potential shares from options, restricted stock, and convertible debt or any type of convertible instrument. But I would try to avoid that altogether by just saying divide by the number of shares. Now that we've walked through the steps in detail, let's talk about how you'd answer this in an interview. So the short story is you're going to keep it super high level. And should you have to discuss all of the nuts and bolts that we just went through, you can discuss that and we just went through it for you. But you really want to keep it high level and stick to these five steps here. So if someone says to me, walk me through a DCF, my answer is going to be, we start by calculating our stage one cash flows for the business. We then calculate the value beyond that, which is our terminal value or stage two. We then take our discount rate and discount back both our stage one cash flows and our terminal value, which gets us to enterprise value. And then we can work from enterprise value to equity value by subtracting debt and adding cash. And if they ask you for the price per share calculation, it's we then take equity value and divide by the number of shares to get to a price per share. Simple as that. And again, if they pull you into the weeds, you've got the bits and pieces to answer that now after this video, but keep it super high level and let them pull you into those details. So hopefully how you'd answer walk me through a DCF in an interview setting makes a little bit more sense now. If you found this answer helpful, definitely hit subscribe down below. We have a lot more of these videos coming and we hope to hear from you soon. Take care.